So there's a lot of grave site conversations going on in the text today, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, right? Uh, we have this, this great image from the prophet Ezekiel, the Valley of Dry Bones. Kind of a scary image, isn't it? He's standing over looking out and there's all these bones, dry bones everywhere. And the Lord calls him to prophesy to the bones that they may come together again. Uh, I loved that image when I was a kid, as a matter of fact, that was one of my favorite things to draw in Sunday school class because it was so morbid. You know, bones and sinew and skin and flesh and all this stuff kind of coming together and forming. Uh, and there was the body, the whole household of Israel standing before uh, Ezekiel in this image, this image of hope for a bright and new future, a future that was not confined to the grave, but now is alive. Isn't that a great image? I want to and then Jesus, of course, hanging out for two extra days just to make sure his good friend Lazarus is dead. <laughs> right? I always had a problem with that part of the text. But, you know, there was no immediate rush to go pray for Lazarus. As a matter of fact, he says several times, I'm doing this on purpose. Something's going to happen so that you can believe. That's, that's the phrase that keeps coming. Anybody, anybody else wrestle with that text? And yet, deep in that text is this this kind of hope, this present hope, that death cannot hold back the things that God is about to do. Matter of fact, what we find in the text that in Lazarus is a lot of times we, we think about our new life that we might receive in Christ, which is great. Praise God for that. Amen. But there's a bigger and deeper story going on in that text. Lazarus represents everything that is old, the old order, the old Israel, the people, the Jews, the old covenant. And what is Jesus about to do? Change it up. You see, you got to wait and let things die sometimes, right? I remember one time we were at the barn. Leslie put me in charge of killing rats. That's a great job, by the way, just so you know. It's a barn job, which is why people always talk to me about guns and gun control and all that kind of stuff, which I'm not going to preach on that today. But some of them, some know my feelings on that. But, but I don't have a problem with shotguns. And they say, well, you don't have a problem with shotguns. I said, no, that's a farm tool. <laughs> <laughs> You've never had to kill rats. <laughs> well, actually, I did it very creatively one time. I, I actually tricked them into a garbage can. And I was going to kill them humanely by attaching a hose to my muffler and then to the can <laughs> so that I could gas them and they would fall asleep nice and peacefully. And so I ran the car, vroom, 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 and sure enough, I heard them jumping around in there, and then they stopped. And I revved it a couple more times, and I thought, dead, right? So I unplugged the hose, I waited a little longer to make sure there was no rustling, nothing. So then I slowly opened the lid, and they were all laying on their sides like this. And I saw one little eye open, and they all started jumping at me! <laughs> Something's going to be dead. You better make sure it's dead. <laughs> Jesus does not want Lazarus just to be asleep for a little while. He wants him to be dead. And so when he arrives, of course, he has compassion. It's his good friend and his, his friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And he goes to the tomb. And what does he do at the tomb? You all know the story. We just read it. It was a 15-minute reading, remember? <laughs> what does he do at the tomb? He tells him, come out. And I love the line that he says, and he tells them to unbind him and let him go. Now, we can read this from a personal and subjective perspective, but we should also read that text from a communal perspective. You see, Jesus is putting to death the old way of doing things. He's calling forth from the grave the new covenant, the new relationship that is to be offered to all in Christ. It got me thinking about the church, and it also got me thinking about a good Florida grave, grave story. So I thought I'd tell it to you today. You ever heard of a guy named Carl Tensler? No? Well, you're going to know about Carl today. You see, Carl uh, immigrated to the United States in the 1920s. Uh, he was German-born. He was a scientist. He ended up living with his sister in Zephyr Hills, Florida. Uh, and while he was in Zephyr Hills for a couple of years, he decided that he wanted to go out on his own. And 
he decided to move to Key West, Florida. Now you're starting to get it, aren't you? Any Key West story is a good story. Carl Tensler happens to be one of the most famous Key West stories around. Carl Tensler got a job as a radiologist at the Marine Hospital down in Key West. And while he was there, this beautiful woman by the name of Elena Oya came into the hospital. She had tuberculosis. When he set his eyes on her, his heart went to flurry. He realized that his one true love was there lying before him. He remembered back to when he was a boy of 10 years old. He had a dream in which his dead aunt came to him and told him that at some point in his life, he would see a woman with long black hair, and he would know in his heart that she was the one that he should be wed to. When he looked at Elena, he realized that she was that woman. Lucky her. So he committed himself to healing her. And he spent a solid year offering her treatments, bringing her to his home, providing for her family. After all, Carl was a wealthy man. Carl, every time he went to see her, would propose to her, will you marry me, will you marry me? And she would refuse him every time. Partially because Carl was in his 50s and Elena was 19. <laughs> she figured he was a little old for her. Well, all of his work and his efforts, medical treatments didn't prevail. Elena passed away. And so they had a huge funeral service for Elena, in which Carl paid to have her buried in Key West Cemetery. Anybody ever been to Key West Cemetery? I love Key West Cemetery. For those of you who don't know me too well, one of my favorite things to do when I travel all over the country is to find a really good old cemetery. I love cemetery walking. Anybody else out there? You all get creeped out when you walk in cemeteries. I don't. I find cemeteries to be fascinating. And I love the statuary, and I take pictures of the statues. I have a whole collection of cemetery statuary photography that I've taken over the years. I love cemeteries because people are bound to a period of time. When you walk into an old cemetery, there they are, all the dead, of every background. It's the great equalizer. Even though you might have a huge monument over top of you, or just a little teeny stone on top of you, everybody's dead. <laughs> and everybody goes to great efforts in the cemetery to tell their story as if there's some way that they can keep them moving throughout time, as if, as if this story is eternal, but it's only an eternal story in the cemetery. It doesn't go anywhere beyond that. And so I love walking through the cemetery, reading the tombstones, taking pictures of the statuary, just realizing that this is the only place you can have this experience. And the testimony of the people that live from whatever time or age before. Matter of fact, statuary art or cemetery tombstones is kind of a dying art, isn't it? You don't see them too much around anymore. Come back to my story. So Carl had Elena buried in the Key West Cemetery, and he built a mausoleum. And he had the mausoleum equipped with electricity, and he had a phone put on the outside and a phone inside the tombstone. And every night, he would go to that mausoleum, and he would call Elena on the phone. This went on for three years. Elena died in 1931, or two years, sorry. And on 1933, under the cloak of darkness, Carl decided to do something drastic. He needed his beloved. And so he broke into the mausoleum and he stole her body. He took her body back to his house and he opened her up and he stuffed her. And then he took mortician's wax and he coated her body and he put her in a beautiful dress and he put her on his bed and he called in a good friend who knew how to keep a secret to marry them. This lasted for seven years. Seven years, Carl and Elena lived in matrimony in his house until Elena's sister decided that something wasn't right. So she went to the gravesite and realized that Elena's body had been stolen. Well, she immediately went to Carl's house to ask him what's going on. And when he walked in the house, he greeted her. And she said, have you seen Elena's body? And he said, well, why don't you step into the other room? Elena's right there sitting in the chair. 
She notified the officials. They came and arrested him. Y'all want to know the rest of the story? Because I could cut it off right there. He's put in jail, but eventually he's released. He's released. Uh, and they decide that in order to keep him from finding Elena's body, they divide it into three parts. And they bury it at three different places over the cemetery. Now, I have to tell you a back story here, real quick. Y'all bored? <laughs> you don't get these kind of stories in church, let me just tell you. <laughs> and there's a big point, you just hold on, a big point to this story. It's coming, just hold on. We're talking about graves today, right? Okay. Well, Carl used to walk during those seven years with his lover in the backyard at night. And his neighbor saw them. And in order to keep him quiet, and he actually worked for the mortician, he bought him a Ford 48, which back then was like the really cool hot rod. When they decided to divide Helena's body up into three and rebury it in the secret parts of the cemetery, the man who was sent to do that was the man who got the Ford 48. So everybody assumed that Elena was buried properly and finally came to a resting place. But when Carl died in the 1950s, they found him in his house, lying on top of Elena. <laughs> There's no April Fools, this is a true story. <laughs> Welcome to Florida, only in Key West. <laughs> Now that story came to my mind when I was reading the text this week and realizing that what God is challenging us to do is to not keep dancing with the corpse. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I've got news for you. God is calling God's church to get out of the past, to quit living in the romance of what happened back then. We've never done it this way before. You know, that's a common mantra in the church, right? Yeah. That God is inviting us to live into a hope-filled future, a resurrection future. God is calling us out of the tomb, and yet I find that the church, the body of Christ, just like the children of Israel when Ezekiel is holding them accountable as a prophet, he's reminding them the church sometimes gets set in its ways. It gets stuck. It gets stuck just like Carl. And you know what's wrong with Elena after Carl takes her out of the grave? He's got a body, but it has no breath in it. God's future is before us. We're going to have to take seriously the challenges that are before us and how to communicate effectively the good news of Jesus Christ in the world and the love of God. We've become so inwardly focused in a church at so many levels. I'm not just talking about Cornerstone. I'm talking about the greater church. That we've dug the body up from the grave, so to speak, to try to preserve it in the way that we remember it. And we can dress it up however we want, but unless we connect with the real issues, unless we unite our heart with the, with the pure call of the gospel, which is to share the love of God in the midst of the world, and to let the walls and the barriers come tumbling down, to stop being a, a sectarian society and realize that this love is available for all, that the church should be this great incubator of God's love, not, not a place of exclusion, not a place of judgment, but a place which receives and welcomes people for who they are and shares this good news together in sometimes a new way and sometimes singing a new song. And I'm not talking about the difference between traditional music and contemporary music. To me, a lot of the things that are going on in churches is just putting a dress on the corpse. I know this is a really hard word for some of you. It's hard for me. I like not changing. But the challenges are before us. Jesus is standing at the tomb. He's saying, come out. Come out. So 
Are we willing to? Are we willing to meet the challenge? I don't know, the body's been in there a long time, it's stinking. <laughs> Our God is not a God who remains idle or stagnant. Our God is not a God of the grave. Our God is the God. We need to identify those things in our life and in our community that are holding us back, that are the obstacles that keep us from moving forward and keep us from reaching other people all around us. You're going to hear this if you come to the My Generation gatherings, but the statistics are staggering. People are coming to the church. Matter of fact, the churches that are growing the most right now, there are some mega churches out there, 5,000, 10,000 people, but you know what? For the most part, they're just borrowing people, church members from other churches. We are not effectively reaching unchurched people because we're dancing with the corpse. We're not sharing the life that God has to give. We're not bearing witness to that life in the midst of the world. And the best way we can do that is by seriously contemplating what it means to love. What does it mean to love? I mean, just like Jesus standing in front of the tomb, we should get a little tear in our eye, concerned about the lives of people around us. Yeah. When we commit to that, to diving into that, to trying to figure out what that means, what that looks like as a community, I think we really begin to live again. But we can't do it unto ourselves. When a body comes together, it requires another element. When Ezekiel stands over the valley of dry bones and he calls all those bones together that comes together and they have flesh or standing before them, they look just like Elena. But they're missing one thing. And what was that thing God says? Breath. You need to breathe. Breathe on these who stand before you that they may live. We need to breathe in the spirit. The spirit that is moving us alive. We need to invite that very breath into our lives. Not just as individuals, but also as a community. That we may live in the midst of the world and share this good news with Jesus Christ with everyone we need. That it should propel us into that place. And it should lead us into a greater desire to want to learn and grow more about that relationship with each other, with our neighbors, with God's creation. And yes, even with ourselves. The glory of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.